Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Tallulah, welcome to Tuesday Talks. Thank you very much, Coco. Thank you for having Tallulah me. Tallulah Randall, you're a world-renowned singer, songwriter, Qigong teacher, therapist, and a creative facilitator. Mm. Did I say Qigong wrong? No, you said it right. <laughs> you said it right. I'm um, so happy to have you here. You're an amazing woman. So we're Thank looking you. forward to hearing your story that no one can even imagine from, <laughs> from A to B. <laughs> so Ethical Hedonist magazine described you as that rare, precious discovery of 2019. A rock and roll singer and songwriter of substance with a heart of a lioness which is fitting because we'll be talking about lions today as well. You've won a highly acclaimed Arts and Culture Award, Woman of the Future. And you're also described as London's most creative woman by AOL. Those are quite good accolades. (laughs) Amazing. Well done. Thank you. Um, So we're going to be talking about a story um, of your music career and the fact that you've crowdfunded um, all of your albums in the world tour. Yeah. So how did that come about? It sounds exhausting just hearing <laughs> you say all that. <laughs> Crowdfunding is difficult in general. How did you come about to come up with the idea to crowdfund your music? So when I first started writing music, I was living with my mum mm. and her basement was full of vinyl. And so I grew up with these beautiful gatefold records and this artwork and the stories. And so when it came to recording, producing my first record, said to Marius, who I was doing it with, I just, I don't want it to just be a CD. I I want it to be vinyl or something like that. And this was kind of early 2000s. So it was just like, well, that's a bad idea. (laughs) So I was was like, okay, well, what could I do that's kind of as close to that, that feels, yeah, that inspired me. And so I came up with this idea of of the books. And my graphic designer at the time was also my drummer. And we basically just did it and then collaborated with different photographers who are friends of mine and different visual artists, different designers, jewelry makers. This is um, yeah, a by a friend of mine, Bex, so cool. who made this in response <laughs> to one of the songs. And, and then I started going to different labels and being like, what do you think about this? And they were like, this sounds really expensive and no one knows <laughs> who you are. Um, so no. Mm. And I was like, hmm. Well, I'm just going to do it anyway. So I basically just did it and I crowdfunded the first one and there was two people that got involved in it. And so what platform did you use? To- so I just did it independently. So I just basically went for investment. Oh, right. Okay. And we didn't have to raise a huge amount of money. It was like 15 grand or something, okay. which is a huge amount of money, but it wasn't in yeah. you know record label terms. And it worked. I basically then toured Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and people were happy to spend 20 pounds or 30 dollars on a book versus 10 pounds on a cd Mm. so i was like okay this 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 framework works i'm just going to keep doing it and so i did and the the next time i did it with pledge music and we raised maybe 30 grand and that was a really big project where we had loads of different artists we made short films it was a really complex project and off the back of that i was signed on a publishing deal and had some music placed in films. Oh, and nice. so kind of things nice. began to tick over, but I decided to stay independent. Okay. Primarily because I just didn't have any space or time to kind of find a manager and pitch. And it was just the system kind of it seemed to be working. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. And it just kind of rolled from that, you know, each record, you know, from The Alive, the second one, and I met Danton and Danton. Supple, who is an incredible producer and a really dear friend. And we made this record together and we made, we've done singles for Save the Children. Uh, we've done lots of different campaigns around kind of environmental issues, writing music and then fundraising. But all, all along the way, it just, the crowdfunding just seemed to work. And there was such a kind of large number of people loving what I was doing that every time I kind of stopped doing something, and there were periods over this, of the last kind of nearly 20, 20 years where I would stop and then people would be like, what's going on? Where's the music? And oh, let's do another, nice. you know. Okay. 
So it just became a, there's a kind of family of people mm. and every, with every crowdfunding campaign, there's new folks that come in, but there's been like a hardcore nice, yeah. percentage at the center that have become friends who then went on to become kind of well-being clients yeah. or like have been on the journey of rock and roll to well-being okay. with me. So yeah. that's why I've kept doing it. And now I'm at a point where I'd really love someone to come and just go okay let's take this music yeah, deep yeah. into the world because there is only so much that you can do sure. as an independent artist nice yeah talking about your mother and your family yes. so you have quite maybe not eccentric is the right word but quite special and different parents i'd say eccentric so- <laughs> <laughs> they'd say eccentric so tell us about your mother what she did and tell us a little bit about your dad so my mum ran away from school and ran to Portugal and set up a nightclub. Okay, pre- as you do. <laughs> yeah, pre the revolution um, called Seven and a Half and hence all the Gatefold Records and then did that, came back here, opened up a nightclub um, called Seven and a Half here in Shepherd's Walk and had kind of like the Stones and Jimi Hendrix and, nice. you know, Jimi Hendrix played her club for two weeks on the proviso that he could rehearse there for free and then the day that Hey Joe went to number one, he was playing in the oh club. Oh, my so God. She was just she's like, fun. you know. Oh, so cool. <laughs> but she's she's really very cool and an inspiring woman and has been kind of like she's been my rock because she's throughout her life, she's reinvented herself. She's an amazing entrepreneur. She's kind of represented different artists. She's kind of, she, you know, worked with Shirley Bassey. She worked with Ivana Trump. She kind of would help kind of, I mean, she's just done some crazy things. She became like an etiquette coach on Ladder to Lady, which was a surreal turn of events for all of us. Right. And still one we can't get. At. But she's very, very cool. Um, so that's mum. And dad, um, dad's an Aussie, was an Aussie. And he came over here in the late 60s with his best friend Ace. And they owned a furniture shop called Sophisticat. No, Gandalf's Garden. I can't remember. Anyway, it was at the end of the King's Road. And they decided one day this was in chelsea right? this is so in chelsea. mid london this is like swinging 60s yeah and this was just before he met my mum. right and they basically in their swinging 60s haze went into harrods one day and there were two lion cubs for sale and for 300 pounds each and decided that that was what they needed to do and buy so they saved up the money selling their pine furniture and went in to buy both but one of them had been stolen so they, the female had been stolen, so they could only buy the male. So they bought the male cub. Wow. This is Harrods, Central this London. This is Harrods, Central London. High-end department store. Four or five, yeah. sometime around there. And they, Twelve viewers in the yeah. who don't know what Harrods is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could buy islands and you could buy elephants. I mean, it was... Yeah, I heard they had an elephant, a baby elephant for sale prior to that. Yeah, it was a weird... Can you imagine? A weird, a weird thing. Um, so basically, they kept Christian... Until he was a year old. And then Bill Travers, who was who played George Adamson in the film Born Free, came into their shop and they were like, Ah, help! We've got this year old huge lion who is just completely domesticated and who would kind of walk down the King's Road with them and like, you know, play football in the local park and, <laughs> you know, like playing with chicks, like literally I mean, he was so like a big cuddly mm, cat. cat um. um anyway. Bill helped them by getting in touch with George Adamson, who thought Born Free was about, and they managed to get the Kenyan government to agree to take Christian back out to Cora, to where George was in Kenya, and rehabilitate him. And at the time, you know, George was really apprehensive as to whether Christian would have any natural instincts at all. He was seventh seventh generation Zulion. And amazingly, he did. And over the course of nine, ten months, basically, George rehabilitated him using Boy, who was the lion in Born Free, who was the main male lion. And it I w- think what, should, what we should kind of say here is whoever hasn't seen this video should watch it. Yeah. But with a box of tissues on the side. Yeah. Um, so this video was made in the 1970s, wasn't it? And so then it late resurfaced 60s. Late, late 60s, okay. And then it resurfaced just a couple of, well, in the 1980s, wasn't it? Or no, so, so basically it was, they filmed, 
um, everything to do with Christian. Right. An old kind of 16 millimeter footage. And the clip that you're referencing was basically after they'd left Christian with George and yeah. they'd come back to England and George was like, just, I need to do my thing. They returned nine, ten a year later. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember. And just before they arrived, um, George said, he's gone. We haven't seen him. There's not really much point in you coming. And they were like, we're going to come. And the day before they arrived, he strolled back into camp. So which is extraordinary. And if you're into kind of any of this kind of telepathy kind of stuff, you know, Rupert Sheldrake and his work around kind of animals and their capacity mm. to connect, it's not surprising that that happened. But it basically changed what happened next was that there's this piece of footage of dad and A standing at the bottom of this hill. And Christian kind of stands up and he looks down and there's like, there's a bit of recognition. He starts walking down slowly and then Ace calls his name and he runs and he just launches <laughs> into their arms. <laughs> and basically this film student randomly found this piece of footage in an wow. archive and unbeknown to all of us, right. put it on YouTube, synced to Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. Yeah, oh my gosh. And it went, it was one of the first, if not the first video to go viral on YouTube. Oh, it completely yeah. changed all our lives. It changed conservation because it showed people mm -hmm. that animals relate, they attach, wild animals relate and attach. And that's and then there was a plethora of other stories that came after that. Right. But it meant that Dad and Ace then spent the rest of their lives talking about conservation, talking about the George Adams and Wildlife Trust, talking about the importance of safeguarding this planet, not only for ourselves, but for all the other animals, the plant species that we coexist with. So it's a really, really important story. And it changed our lives. And when dad passed away a couple of years ago, it was horrific. And it was really intense because it we were kind of like slightly bombarded by the app, like the number of journalists. And like we had, you kind of had no idea how big this story is until he passed away. And I mean, literally on every news channel, every magazine, newspaper was this story. And we were getting messages all around the world from wow. from people to saying how sad they were and how moved they'd been by this story. It was absolutely, yeah, you it, it was a really extraordinary <laughs> yeah. experience. So how did your lives change after that video went viral? We started talking about lions a lot more. Right. <laughs> I mean, so we all kind of dead. So nothing happened in between. Nothing happened. Interesting. In between. So it was. But the I mean, video it, that sparked. it always it had always been part of my life. Yeah. So it would always be something that I talked about. I've always been involved in conservation. I've always right. been involved in, you know, charities to do with sustainability. And, you know, there's another one called City to Sea run by a really dear friend of mine. So I wrote a piece of music and we used that piece of music to campaign for moving plastic from the ocean. Right. Um, so for me, there's always been an affiliation. Um, there's always been a relationship with Christian. And one of the pieces of art, for example, in my second album was a piece of art representing Christian and dad. Mm. Um, I was always really, really proud of proud of it. Yeah. And um, But how it changed our lives is that I guess we all became much more in the public eye again. Right. Um, and people have always asked me, you know, what drives me as an artist? Is it to be famous or is that, you know, because that's such a thing for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, I've grown up with fame. I've sure. been surrounded by that. That's never been my driving force. Yeah. You know, I'm an artist. I write, I create, and I love it. And I'm really fortunate in that I've got parents who were so entrepreneurial and eccentric and weird and wonderful that they've supported my journey as an artist mm. and as a facilitator. And I'm really comfortable talking about yeah. this stuff. I've been doing things like this for decades. Right. So it, yeah. Because you have been endorsed like from the likes of Dame Shirley Bassey, the legend Jules Holland, mm. the Latitude, uh, Latitude Festival, BBC Radio. And they've all said that you have superstar potential. So that must mean something. <laughs> or is it just like, bless it, because you're so used to it? No, I mean, great, when right? like Dame Shirley yeah. Bassey says, you've got a wonderful voice, or Crazy. Jules Holland yeah. says, that's a great record. You're like, yeah, thank you. Wow. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, just goosebumps. And this is such a hard industry to be involved mm. in. And you get, like any creative person, you get so many no's. Hmm. so many no's 
And, you you know, it, there's just been part of my sustainability has been through my family mm. encouraging me on mm. through my practices, you know, which we're going to talk about yeah. soon. And just through this creativity that just surges through me that mm. if I don't write music, yeah. It, that my system kind of just yeah. kind of does this, you know, it's part of my kind of um, emotional hygiene, so yeah, to speak, sure. my way of processing. Yeah, nice. So how did you meet, for example, I, Ivor Nov- um, Marius De- uh, Vries? Marius De Vries. Yeah, and other. So I wrote a piece of film music for a woman called Rebel Penfold Russell, who produced um, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert right. in early yeah. 2000. Yeah, I remember that. And um, she basically said, I will put some money into you making a record as long as you work with Marius. And oh, I was no. like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, he'd just come off Moulin Rouge and Romeo and Juliet Amazing. and Madonna's Ray of Light. And working with Marius was, I mean, it was like a wake-up call. You know, you suddenly go from very little recording experience for working with one of the top producers in the world and um you know it was an amazing it was a challenging experience because I was such a young artist and I was really unclear about my sound and my direction and um but we made a record that we were all really proud of and yeah I'm really grateful to wonderful yeah yeah so the only way is up (laughs) yeah so apart from your music career you're also a healer um I'm a facilitator. Facilitator. Okay, so tell us how you got into that. So why did you get into that? So after touring out in, I did this kind of worldwide tour and, it, you know, that part of it was, you know, organized by me. I had a fake booking agency under a pseudonym called right. Toulouse, um, Sophia Brewer. Okay. <laughs> and it, um, I booked lots of shows and I got onto a support tour and I toured with um, some musicians from my band. But the combination of doing, you know, not only producing, co-creating, like, you know, running these kind of projects and booking tours and then touring them was just like burnout. Sure. Yeah. And I basically got back to London and I was staying with mum at the time and I was just burnt out. I was having really extreme panic attacks. I was not sleeping. I was so anemic. Right. Because I had just pushed myself so hard and this is common with people that want to that are kind of up and coming and they want to get a lot of things done like let's say for new artists who want to go down the route that you've gone I don't know if it's necessarily common from that trajectory I mean there's a lot of artists who burn out because they're just getting really high right okay you weren't doing that <laughs> no, no, I think they're just getting really wasted right okay. so there's like a kind of you know so why, there's two different kinds of burnout there's two different kinds of burnout but there's like you know you get burnout in all industries and that's yeah. not just that I remember when I folded my first company yeah I, could, I couldn't open an, uh, an envelope anymore I'm like I just don't have the energy yeah anymore. it's just complete exhaustion from yeah. just being driven and driven yeah. and driven and driven and you know what drives that can be systemically traumatic there can be trauma within the system that's driving you yeah. to just push and push yeah. and push the book, it was the same and push yeah. And so there comes a part of kind of resolving what's that underlying trauma to be able to change that pattern. And so for me in that moment, there was like, I, I want to keep creating. I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I need to change my lifestyle. Mm. And what came into my life was Qigong, Chinese medicine, nutrition, and kind of educating myself around that. And I just, it was like a duck to water. I was just like, oh my God, with the Qigong, it was, I felt it so automatically in my system I felt the energetics kind of move yeah. that I was like I just want to do more of that so I started going to Qigong camps I I did a two-year teacher training not because I wanted to teach it I just wanted to yeah, be immersed I in know. it and it's just unfolded from that every kind of training that I've done was because it's just led me to somewhere else you know I suddenly was drawn towards sound healing you know as a vocalist as someone that loves Mm -hmm. instruments it was like oh okay how can I use sound to support people regulating their nervous system right and so I did sound therapy training and then I'm completely fascinated by somatic therapy so I've been immersed in that world and then authentic relating which is really learning how to communicate Mm -hmm. how to kind of relational Aikido how to work with people when there's charge in the system and now I'm exploring something called systemic 
systemic coaching and constellation work. And this is all because this is just something that really fascinates me. Mm. And then in the same breath, it's kind of transformed my life. And I never went out going, I'm going to be a facilitator. Mm. But it just happened. And people started asking me to run voice empowerment workshops. People started asking me to teach them Qigong or um, public speaking. And sort of fast forward now, you know, I have this world as a songwriter. Yeah. And then I have my world as a facilitator. And I work, you know, with Soho House. I work with lots of different corporates, basically running well-being workshops, supporting people to set boundaries, how to avoid burnout, how mm. to communicate authentically. And ostensibly, the root of all of that is Qigong. So it's just, that's just... <laughs> Interesting. It's, that's what I've... That's, so where do we find you if we want to take one of these courses with you? <laughs> so I have two websites. I've got Tulu right. Rendell, which is all things musical. Mm -hmm. And then I've got Tulu Rendell Wellbeing, which right. is all things kind of corporate and in that realm of things, you know, for sound, I, so I do sound bursts, I do one-to-one -one courses, um, I do coaching. And the way that it works is that it basically has enabled me to continue being an artist and have a really healthy lifestyle mm. and share when I can, when I have time with other people. And it's just it fascinates and it weaves like this. Yeah, I'm sure. So it's, yeah. So those of you who haven't heard your voice, highly, highly recommend it. It Thank is so you. therapeutic. I was, like, I was listening to it in the car on the way home one day and I'm like, that's like an angel singing. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Really beautiful. So highly recommend it. Thank you. So Tallulah, what are some of your plans for the future? So, you know, this album, Love Carries Me Home, which is sonically so different from the other records because mm. it was written in lockdown. Right. I was on my own, didn't have other band members. And so it's an acoustic record with harp and double bass. It's it's sonically this this little world. <laughs> and it's dedicated to dad. And the songs really um, are a kind of... It's hard to kind of articulate really, but basically... They are a distillation and a kind of little golden nugget of what it is that I believe in mm -hmm. as a human being. So there's a kind of real focus on loving kindness, on empowerment. And that this kind of intention behind this record and releasing this record was that it would inspire, I hoped it would inspire other people, mm -hmm. that they would find these songs really healing in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, I wrote them in response to, I'd had a really horrific, fairly abusive relationship in lockdown and dad died and I was in isolation I have it was my universe kind of went like this mm. and the only way that I could kind of find my way through it was through the qigong through the sound meditation through the loving kindness practices and one of my teachers was showing up every day um, on youtube and holding these loving kindness meditations and our sangha kind of a global sangha was brought together mm. And that was such a lifeline for me during this time that it led to me writing Love Carries Me Home, which is this song all about really finding the love that's within you mm. rather than kind of Extended, needing somebody yeah. else. Um, and Be a Little Kinder, which is all about acknowledging, it's actually really acknowledging the beauty of what happened in lockdown, the silence and the stillness. And actually, can we be a little bit kinder to ourselves, each other, but also the planet? Yeah. You know, because in those moments where we stopped traveling and you could hear birdsong, the kind of animals started coming mm -hmm. back and you could, there was a point where there were, there was birdsong underneath the Golden Gate Bridge that had never been heard. Birds, I can't remember what bird it was, mm. it was a golden finch or something, started singing notes, which they'd never sung. Oh they'd never gosh. had recorded. Wow. But, you know, suddenly the, the rest of the planet took this massive mm, out breath. 100%. Yeah. Um, so so it's a great photo, I'm sorry, to, with the cow in the sea. I really... It was walking around in the sea. I mean, <laughs> stuff like that just really, yeah. really kind of moved something in me and led to this album. And so there's kind of mantras on it. There's um, a song called I'm Enough, which is really... Which I was really surprised when I released it, how much it touched people for me it was this song about kind of reminding myself that I'm enough just as I am after this horrific breakup 
But then I suddenly realized that how many other people experience this belief, how in, kind of, it's like an epidemic. Yeah. And what happens as a consequence of that is we buy stuff, we consume and we consume and we consume. And what happens if we kind of actually address that kind of root mm. trauma? So it's literally in my book. It's a whole chapter dedicated to, do you need to be in a relationship? Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, yeah. So to kind of circle and answer, yeah. come back to your question. So, you know, now that this album's out in the world, it was released about six weeks ago. Um, and, you know, sonically, it's niche, you know, mm -hmm. folk music is kind of maybe like over here and the kind of, I was like, it feels really important to take this music really into the mainstream. If you were going to take like Dharma into the mainstream, how would you do it? Right. And I love melodic techno. I love to dance. <laughs> I am like, I'm like the first person on any dance floor. I'm the person where they're like, are you really high? And I'm like, no, I just really love to dance. And I like to dance <laughs> with wild... just beating the wild... Ibiza most of the day, yeah. most of the year, right? <laughs> yeah. I, live, you know, I dance with wild abandon. And nice. so my mission was nice. to then basically remix some of the kind of core tracks on this record. Okay into melodic techno so that they could be sunrise sunset in the Beethoven club yes. and that people my hope was that this marriage this marriage this message would um would go deeper into life and hopefully inspire more and more and more people okay. and that's my kind of thing as an artist as a facilitator as a human being it's just to kind of really be an embodiment of what it is that i believe mm -hmm. and hope that that will inspire other people to kind of take greater care of themselves yeah. other people and this planet very important and we'll take that as a takeaway message for today that is my mission yeah <laughs> Tallulah thank you so much for being my guest it's you're a so welcome story. you're so welcome and for the viewers and listeners please subscribe and like our channel thank you so much <laughs> yay